Hi there. Hi, my name is Andy Goldberg. I am here in Las Vegas, Nevada, United States, and I'm very happy to be here today talking to you about speeding up Python. I wanted to say thank you to all the staff and all the organizers of PyCon and say thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm sad a little bit that we're not all together in person, but uh, that is what COVID has done globally. So hopefully uh, not too long from now, we'll be able to reconnect uh, with, with some of my old friends there and, uh, and get together in person. But for right now, just wanted to say thanks and I'm looking forward to this. I am going to start by sharing my screen here. There we go. So my talk today is called Speeding Up Python with Joblib, which is a software package and AWS, Amazon Web Services which is uh, a hardware component. We're gonna use their uh, servers to really uh, accelerate our code. Uh, my alternate title is how I played a hundred million hands of blackjack and only lost $1. Uh, and of course I'm talking about simulated games. Um, that's the magic of uh, our computers is we can model and simulate a game um, and using the AWS servers, it's going to cost me a lot less than $1. Um, besides being incredibly time consuming, uh, it would be impossible to play 100 million hands of anything and only lose a dollar. So like I said, I'm a consultant. Um, my, my name is Andy Goldberg. I'm in Las Vegas, USA. I am a consultant and the focus uh, of my uh, consultancy is primarily casino resort. So I've had a lot of uh, experience helping casinos improve their operations, run more efficiently, um, do a better job of marketing to their players and um, matching up the games people want to play with their intended customer base. Um, obviously, I do some coding as well, um, building mobile apps and uh, Websites and backends. Uh, I prefer to uh, write those in Kotlin and in Python. And uh, when I do some mobile work, I use uh, Flutter for that. So um, that's a little bit about me. And um, let's get started here today. Um, what are we going to learn? The goal, obviously, is to speed up our Python simulation code. And as I mentioned, we're going to implement two concepts. Uh, Joblib, which will make it very easy to um, run our code concurrently or in parallel, and using high power multi core servers that we can rent from AWS. Um, one or the other is only going to give us a limited speed up. But when we combine the two together, we run, we use the parallelism on a server that is uh, highly optimized to take advantage of that, that's when we will see a huge speed up. And that's, uh, that's our goal. So, um, well, real quick, I'm gonna say, this is a real life scenario. So earlier this year, I invented a new variant on the game of blackjack. Um, and, in order to do so, I had some ideas, but it was very important to get the exact rules implemented and figure out how that affects the game odds and how that affects the optimal player strategy. So the way to determine those things was to simulate hands of blackjack games um, basically at least 100 million times. When you're dealing with randomness, like shuffling cards, there's a lot of volatility. So when you only do it a few thousand times, uh, even tens of thousands, or even in the low millions, there's still a lot of volatility between your results. When you run it, then repeat it um, and get some different results. It's only when you uh, the sample size is large enough. And to me, I found that to be at least about 100 million hands. 
um, when you can get results that are reliable and repeatable. So like I said, this is a challenge that I faced earlier this year when I knew I needed to speed up my simulation because it was taking overnight for me to get to that 100 million hands. And every time I wanted to make a new rule change or test a new rule change, I had to wait a whole day to see the results. So I needed to investigate various ways of speeding up my Python code. What I came up with is what I'm going to show you today. It's certainly not the only way to do it, but I found it to be easy, inexpensive, and simple to get started, um, as opposed to using PyPy or re-engineering my code to use a synchronous uh, programming or something like that. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm simulating a variant of Blackjack. Um, it's not super important, but just real quick, um, Blackjack is the most popular casino card game in the United States and also in the UK. Uh, in casinos in Singapore or Macau uh, or Manila, for example, you're most likely to see Baccarat as the most popular game. And some of you may be familiar with one or both of these games, but they're similar. They're card games. The idea is to get the, the highest value. Uh, but there are some differences in blackjack. Every player has their own individual hand versus Baccarat. There's just no matter how many people are at the table, there's one player and one banker hand and people just bet on one side or the other uh, in blackjack. Like I said, every player has their own individual hand. The player must go first before the dealer goes and the player is only able to see one of the play of the dealers two initial cards so they are making their decisions based on imperfect information they also have the autonomy to make their own decisions in baccarat all decisions as to whether to take another card are predefined in blackjack the player is able to choose and um, is often able to make a decision um, that is unwise as well as wise. So good player, there's a skill element because good players know when to make certain moves. Also in blackjack, once you go over 21, you lose, you're out. Unlike Baccarat where, for example, if you get a uh, five and then a eight, that would give you a 13, which is obviously higher than nine, in Baccarat, the one is discarded and we only deal with the final digit, which is the three. So that would be the new score in Blackjack. Like I said, you do add up the scores. And if you go over 21, boom, that's it, you're out. So my Python game simulator runs as a Jupyter Notebook. Um, they're not using any vectors, no data frames. So we're not gonna use Python, uh, NumPy or Pandas. We are reliant on a random number generator. Fortunately, the built-in one in Python is very good. It uses a um, strong algorithm. Um, my code is highly object-oriented, um, which is something you don't always see in uh, Jupyter Notebooks, which are often like sequential or scriptable code. Um, so what I'm gonna show you today using Joblib, using AWS, I have not tried it with NumPy or with Pandas. Um, these packages both use a lot of optimized C code underneath. So I don't know if it would have the same effect because that C code obviously does run very fast. Um, and the same with using vector math um, where lots of values are updated in a single operation. Um, that may not give the same sort of speed ups when you utilize these techniques. Same thing if you're using machine learning uh, packages like Keras, like TensorFlow that already have a lot of optimizations built in. And the other part is they are optimized to work with graphics processors, GPUs. When we rent our server from Amazon, it is a high CPU machine. So I have not tried it. I don't know if you would get the same uh, speed boost when using those packages. So the first concept is Joblib. 
right? So basically it's very simple way to implement parallelism into your code. And their slogan is embarrassingly parallel for loops. Embarrassingly parallel being a joke that it's so easy. Um, but here's the before uh, code. I'm trying to run 30,000 simulations. Um, here's my function called play game, get players, gives me my list of the players at the table. The bet amount is how much each of them bet and how many games to simulate, which is 30,000. So it's just a single uh, function with three parameters. To implement joblib, uh, obviously we first have to install it with pip, very simple. And we need to put an import statement at the top of our code, also very simple. But after that, it's really just a, uh, uh, modifying just a single line of code by adding the parallel and the delayed keywords. So parallel tells it how many jobs do we want it to run at a time? In other words, how uh, many CPU cores are we trying to utilize? Um, it's not actually one to one, it seems to be like a two to one uh, ratio. And then the delayed is basically asks for the name of the function, play game, which is the same that we had here, and the same parameters, get players, bet amounts, games per loop, which in this case, instead of having 30,000 run in a row, I'm creating 16 loops with 1875 each. The total is still the same, 30,000. And here's where we designate the number of loops, so 16. So basically, um, I'm going to have like eight operations running at once, once, each of which just has a small portion of the overall uh, number of games. So there is a small um, difference with the results. The first code will return a single result, whereas because we're running in parallel and we're splitting up the job, the job lib results will come as a list of results. And um, you're then responsible for sort of using that list to get the ultimate results that you want. You can have a list of just numbers, or if your function returns an object or a tuple or a list itself, then you're gonna have a list of lists, list of tuples, list of objects. And you just have to put that back together. Sometimes it's simple, sometimes it's a little bit more complicated. Um, in my code, it's sort of middle. Um, I do have to, I just sort of reorganize the output. But that's essentially it. You're just rewriting a single line of code and doing it very simply. And again, to me, that's much easier than um, reconfiguring your entire code base to use asynchronous code or greenlets or something like that. Um, and also without having to go through the implementation of something like PyPy. Um, so just that one line of code um, is going to give us a big boost. And then the hardware component is using a rented server from Amazon, AWS, Amazon Web Services. EC2 is one of many services that they offer. Uh, if you're not familiar, um, it's probably the most basic in the sense that you're just renting a server down to the bare operating system. So it's up to you to make sure that you have a recent version of Python and all the dependencies you need. Um, what I found was to start out, there is a free open source disk image called the Anaconda AMI. You may be familiar with Anaconda distribution, um, but they already package for you a recent Python and almost everything you need for anything numerical in the Python world. It's got pandas and NumPy and lots and lots of packages already implemented. Um, so most of what we will need as well is implemented. Um, you do need to do some setup work ahead of time, which I'm not going to show today. You need, like I said, to start with this disk image. Then in our example, we need to pip install joblib. You need to set up your folders. You need to set up your security. You need to install any other dependencies you're going to need. But it's relatively simple, and you can do that um, 
at a very low cost. You don't need to rent a high power server. You can do it at a server that just costs a penny or two um, per uh, hour. So just a few bot. Um, you want to use spot instances because we're only going to renting, be renting the server for a brief period of time. And that's a great way of saving even more money. Um, it reduced the cost over a what's called a reserved instance by uh, 50 to 75 percent. You need to have an SSH connection between your local computer and the AWS server, and you need to set up port forwarding so that you're connecting from your computer to the server's expected port for a Jupyter connection. And we'll see that in a minute. And finally, don't forget to terminate because if you don't, Amazon will continue to bill you and charge you for all the hours that the server is active, even if you are not actually using it, it still costs money. So if you don't terminate at the end of the month, you're going to get a much larger bill than you were expecting and all your savings are gone. So let's run some code. Let's do this. And let's start by running our Jupyter code locally and seeing the effects of adding each of the pieces in there um, and getting the speed boost that we're hoping for. So just typical, you're I'm sure you're um, used to or familiar with starting up a Jupyter Notebook and um, get it all loaded. My computer, I can already tell, is running slower than normal. I think that's because I had the Zoom meeting and recording this. So that's already taking up some of my CPU resources. Um, and then when we run the code and especially do it in parallel, that's gonna limit my speed to, to lower than it actually um, normally is, but we're gonna work with that. Um, so you can see here, here's my imports. Everything's pretty um, basic and standard. Here's the job lib, and you see I'm importing two keywords, parallel and delayed, as I showed earlier. Um, here's my card values. Here are my card suits. Um, this here is a matrix of player strategies. Uh, my individual um, uh, objects and classes for, the, for a single card, for a shoe, which is uh, essentially multiple decks of cards for a hand, which is comprised of multiple cards, uh, for a player and all the decisions that the player has to make, for the dealer, which also has a hand, but uh, isn't, doesn't have the choice of when to hit or to stand, and the game, which sort of coordinates all the individual objects and determines who is the winner at the end and how much to pay out to each of the winners uh, and all that. We have a logger. But um, this is the code that's sort of uh, key here. And I apologize for going through this fast, but we are limited on time. So I'm going to run everything up to this point. This is our play game function. And this is where we actually use it, where we say we're going to want to simulate 150,000 games. We're going to, here's our play game function with just a single player named Kevin, his bet is going to be $100 every hand, and the games to sim is right here, 150000 So when we run this, this is our baseline. This is our first run, and let's see how long it takes us. We'll give us a status update every 25,000 hands. That's from just right here uh, every time. The hand number is divisible by 25,000. We just print out where we're at. So we get some kind of feedback. And you can see it, it's not really in any hurry. It's taken a little while to run, um, but that's okay. We'll give it a, a few more seconds and let it go. And we are almost there. 
Wow. Okay. 58.4 seconds. 58.4 seconds to run 150,000 hands. Point four one. So that's about 2,500 hands per second. Um, all right, so our first speed up is just to, to run with five players at the table at once. Like I said earlier, in blackjack, every player gets their own hand. So we only need to run 30,000 loops this time because each loop will be five distinct hands. Uh, so this should take less time to run, uh, but we still have not implemented any parallelism. Uh, it's just uh, a small speed up due to having more players at the table. Um, so obviously each round is gonna take a little bit longer to run because there's five players making decisions each time, but the overall amount of time should be reduced. And yes, there it is, 34.7 seconds. So we, that gets us to divided by 43 hundred hands per second. But now we're gonna use job lib. And again, here's our loops. We're taking what was 30,000 simulations and like I uh, demoed it, whoops. We are running 16 loops uh, at 1875 a piece, eight jobs. That's if my uh, computer can handle that. Uh, I'm running it, this on an old laptop that only has, uh, I think, uh, I guess it has a quad core uh, chip in it, but certainly, any, certainly not something that's fast by any means. Um, also, when you run job lib, you don't get the results in the notebook, you get it in the console window. Um, but here we go, the output is, is printed to the notebook and we completed this in 20.58 seconds. So that now has us at 150,000 hands divided by 20.58, 7288 hands per second. You can see here that 150,000 games, it's comprised of five players playing 30,000 each. And um, according to this, and this is why, like I was saying earlier, just doing a few hundred thousand hands isn't enough. This is saying that the house advantage is 0.011, which is 1.1%, which is higher than my target. Um, and because I know, because I've run hundreds of millions of hands, I know that that's not actually very accurate, that that's higher than it ought to be. But that's the, um, getting through the notebook locally on my computer. So let's save it. And now let's open up the EC2 console. If you are unfamiliar, Amazon has tons of services available, uh, computing, database, storage, DNS, security, all kinds of stuff. Here's a whole list. But like I said, EC2 is pretty much the basic one. So we're gonna request a spot instance. As I said earlier, you do need to have things prepared ahead of time. Um, and I'm not showing that today, but I'm, um, I have a launch template set up, which has my disk um, and all the parameters already set. But what's important here in the spot instance is to say, what are my specs? And most importantly, how many virtual CPUs? So I'm going to start with a machine with at least 32 and about 30 gigs of memory. The rest, the network is all set up. I'm only going to use one uh, computer, but if you were doing something massively parallel or with uh, a lot more computing uh, capacity, you can rent as many as you need, uh, you know, dozens, hundreds even. But here's our estimated charges. So because we're doing a spot instance, we don't know exactly which uh, specs we're gonna get, but it's 
They all have 32 CPUs. They all have at least, in fact, more than 30 gigabytes. And here's our price. And here's our discount. So you can see, like I was saying earlier, the spot instance is a lot less expensive. And you can see we're saving up to between 57 and 80%. Um, so these are the rates per hour. So something between 54 and 47 cents. That translates to about 17, 18 bot per hour. And we're not even going to be renting the server for an hour. In fact, quite a bit less. So you can see this is extremely inexpensive. We're going to launch. And this will start up a single instance, which we will connect to once we see its status. All right, still says pending, give it a few seconds. Usually it's pretty quick. Here's our basically host DNS address. We copy that and our SSH connection. This is my SSH client on Windows called Bitvise. Everything is already saved to the profile, but because you're starting up a new server, it's got a new IP address. So you do have to update the host uh, address, but everything else, the port, the username, is, is good. I've already set it up with port forwarding, like I stated earlier. When I connect to 9999 on my local computer, that will be forwarded to 8888 on the Amazon server, and 8888 is where Jupyter listens. So that's uh, going to be good for us. And let's see if I can um, log in. There we go. Accept. Perfect. I'm going to start a new terminal. I am going to start a SFTP window to upload our Jupyter Notebook. So we just save everything is on the disk except for the latest version of the notebook, because anytime you make some edits or changes, um, they're not necessarily going to persist. So this way you can just upload it. I've already done that. I go to the terminal window. I can see there's the notebook I just uploaded, IPYNB, and I am going to run Jupyter Notebook on this server. And I'm going to specify, because it's a server, um, no browser. I don't need it to launch a web browser because I am not using the servers. UI. I'm going to use my local computer's browser and connect over SSH. All right, here is our address copied. Don't need that. Don't need that. Let's open up a new browser window, paste it in. And like I said, we're using that port forwarding. So this is a browser on my local computer. I'm going to tell it to connect to 9999. That is arbitrary. You can use any port you want, but you do need it to connect to 8888 on the server. And here we go. There's my two notebooks available. This one, since we just completed it locally and then uploaded it, this is still going to have our results. Um, if we scroll down, yeah, the 20.58 seconds is right there. Same with the 34 and the 58 seconds. So let's clear those out. Um, run everything to here. And then we can start our simulations again. The 150,000 with a single player, um, you can see it's running faster than it did on my local computer. Um, although this is still not a speed at which I'd want to wait for it to complete 100 million. So, okay, 14.75 seconds. Remember that took 58 seconds earlier. 
now with five players. Here we go. This took 34.7 seconds on my local computer. Uh, on this server, 9.8 seconds. So we are definitely getting a speed up just from using a faster server. Um, but now is the real test. Now we're going to run with the parallelism of that Joblib gives us on a server with lots and lots of cores. And this, which took 20 seconds to run, 20 and a half seconds, finishes, boom, 1.49 seconds. And in fact, a lot of that time was used to just get this setup going and to recombine the results at the end. And at the same time, we only have eight jobs running on a 32 core machine. So let's up this quite a bit to 64 jobs. Let's run 128 loops and let's actually increase the size of each loop to 7,500. All right, so this is going to be 128 loops times 7,500 games times five players at each game. That is 4.8 million hands. And let's run that and see what we get. As I said, the, the, um, all the individual uh, logs and updates happen in the terminal window, not in the Jupyter window until the end. And now it's completed and 20.7 seconds. So, okay, that's actually pretty funny because it took 20 and a half seconds to run the 150,000 hands on my local computer and almost the exact amount of time to run 4.8 million hands on the AWS server. So let's calculate 4.8 million divided by 20.77 seconds, 231,000, wow, 20.77. So we got to 231,000 hands per second, one second, that's not too bad. 231,000, we started out at only 2568. So we have an 89 point, a 90 times speed up from our original baseline without any parallelism, without any multiple cores to 90 times faster by using the multi-core server with, a, with Joblib handling all the parallelism for us. So that is what we're trying to do. This was a great speed up for me. Um, I mentioned terminating before I finish up. I'm going to do that right now. Instant state terminated. So I don't forget and I don't run up a huge bill. Everything now is disconnected. Here we are again. So the results. So I know I did that a little bit quickly. I was able to iterate. So every time I had a rule change, I could run. We saw 5, 5 million, 4.8 million hands being run in just 20 seconds. That means I could run 100 million hands in only about seven minutes, right? So I could make a change to the rules, run the simulation, test it out, see the results. If I liked it, keep it. If I didn't like it, go backwards or try something new and repeatedly iterate until I found a set of rules and set of player strategies that worked. Um, and here in the United States, there's a lot of legal issues, but you need a certification agency to validate all your results. Because I had done so many simulations and was so familiar with all my um, runs, when I did go to the certification agency, there were no surprises, no hiccups, uh, no, no, no problems because I knew that my code at this point and my simulations were correct because I had run so many simulations. So it worked out great. Like I said, this was a real 
uh, challenge that I was facing earlier this year. And because I was able to build um, a fast simulation engine, everything went smoothly. So finally, I just want to say thank you again to PyCon APAC. I hope we can do it again. Please, I'm happy to answer questions, but please, uh, there's my email address. There is an article on my website, cfnine.com, which talks about this a little bit more in depth. And you can even play my game online right there at play.dealerfirstblackjack.com. So I'm just going to um, go back here and just once again say thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, hope to see you all soon. Kap kun krap. And take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Okay, hi guys, we are with Andy Nels. Andy is in USA-based casino data analytic consultants, game inventor, software developer, and database marketing efficiency experts. He struggled with the word the way we have done it before and constantly improving. Andy, thank you for joining me today on live Q&A. You talk about 100 million uh, blackjack hand and you only lost one dollar thank to python job leave and aws right yeah and how are you andy i'm doing great thanks very much the conference has been terrific i've seen uh, quite a few uh very interesting talks and uh it's been a lot of fun yeah yeah your talk is very encourages to do to be more proactive and trying to find a better way to optimizing saving costs and time thank you that's amazing thank you very yes, much definitely. Andy. Okay, so I will start with the question number one. Okay, uh, what were some of the key finding or setback when you were exploring the framework of the rivalry? Yeah, so uh, what I thought was interesting was just when you when you start on a new project, and especially if it's something that's a little bit different than what you've done before, which this definitely was for me. And this, you know, this was a real world situation. This, this wasn't just an exercise, you know, for, to create for a talk. This is a real project. And That's cool. what I found was you, your experience overall in past programming projects and also everything that you've sort of learned via going to conferences or talking to people or, you know, seeing articles written about, it all comes together when you're working on a new type of project because you're like, well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this well? And all of a sudden, things that, you know, you might have like seen at a conference or, or heard someone talk about a long time ago, it's like, oh, maybe this is a great use for this. Joblib specifically was not something I had used before, but I had seen it. And now here was like a perfect opportunity to try it out and to actually use it. But if I hadn't um, been aware of it prior, you know, there's a lot of solutions for parallelism in, in Python, you know, with the whole Asyncio and things like greenlets and stuff like that. There are other options, but Joblib worked for me and I was glad that I knew just, I had never used it, but I knew that it existed. And once I sort of checked it out again, I was like, hey, you know, this is perfect. It's much easier to use than rewriting all the, the code differently. So, I mean, key findings is like, no matter what you think, all your experience over time comes together and works out, you know, and you can use it at some point. So stay with an open mind. Yeah. Stay with the open mind. I will keep that in mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question from Andrew, uh, I like your simple approach to the problem using Joblib. Did you consider mm -hmm. try the option before going ahead with Joblib? Right. So that's sort of extension. Yes. I mean, there were other options for parallelism, but this seemed like the simplest and the least intrusive to the code that I was writing. Um, and it worked well, uh, sort of, in line and it worked well with what I was doing. So um, I did think about other options and sort of investigated like what was going to be necessary, but um, Joblib 
specifically was was great. Um, and I messed around with its own, you know, internal options. I set it, you know, to the defaults, but to start, but try different things. You know, it has internal options for threading um, mm -hmm. methods and things like that. Um, and I tried and saw, you know, figured out what worked and what didn't work. So, um, but ultimately, yeah, I stuck with pretty much basic stuff and it worked great. So I was happy. <laughs> Yeah, that's very cool. Okay, the next question. Uh, in your talk, you mentioned about build Kotlin model to shake result. Can you tell us more about yeah. that? Yes. So, okay. So, again, this is a real world problem, and yeah. it's a little different than other software projects where you you know ahead of time what the inputs are going to be and what you expect the output to be. Right. Think of when you do tests in code you are asserting what the answer is. You're saying, here's the input. I'm telling you what the answer should be. And then you run the test to see if you get that. In this particular case, I was modeling a real world process that I didn't know the answer to. So I had no way of like knowing whether I was getting accurate results or not. And, and inaccurate results could have come from a... Um, not necessarily like a bug in the code, but like a logic problem where I'm modeling a game and I'm paying out a winner when it wasn't a winner or, or vice versa. I was not paying out when the per player had won. So I had nothing to check the results in. So I did build a second model in a totally different language using a slightly different, you know, even style. So I wouldn't repeat any errors if they existed and use the two models to check the results against each other. So when I was um, figuring out that the, the what's called the house edge or the house advantage came out to about 0 0.67 of a percent, I wanted to make sure my other model agreed that that was accurate so that I had something to check against each other. So in, in you know, again, this is a real world problem here in the U S Get anything gambling related is very heavily regulated. I have to go to the state, you know, gambling control board that oversees everything. And you have to go to them with mathematical results to say your game is fair to the player, but profitable to the casino. Yeah. And I have to, and the thing is, they won't accept those results from me because I'm not like, they don't know who I am. So I have to go to a third party that will also model this game and come up with the results. That's all. That's very expensive. So I want to go to that. I only want to bring them into it when I know that my results are correct and that they yeah. this third party is going to match. I didn't want to go yeah. to them with like maybe it's working, maybe it's not. So that's the key. I I had two models. When I got them to match, then I was able to go to the third party, and of course their model agreed with mine and now we can go to the state and say you you don't trust me understandably but these this company is licensed by you and they are agreeing with my results and so you'll accept their results and that's how it works oh that's very cool and a more question from uh, andrew uh, a little off topic but interesting in what sort of tasks you would choose calling for rather than Python and vice versa. Yeah, so I, I happen to be a big fan of Kotlin. Um, <laughs> Kotlin does a lot of things I like. And I, I was just listening to the, one of the other Python sessions where it was like, what's Python going to be in 2030? And there was a little bit of um, discussion whether types are needed, things like that. Uh, yeah. Personally, I like uh, static typing. I like immutability. I like functional program style, you know, using math and reduce and filter quite a lot, which exists in Python, but not natively. Python prefers like the list comprehensions. Um, and of course, uh, Kotlin is a JDM um, language, so it's compiled, um, you know, which has pluses and minuses. But like, for example, in this particular case, the Kotlin model as much as I sped up the Python model, the, Py the Kotlin model ran about 10 times faster than that. 
Um, so, you know, there, you know, when, when, when speed is important, um, when, I, you know, again, those things that I mentioned, static typing, immutability, functional programming, they tend, in my opinion, to reduce errors and reduce bugs. So, um, having, you know, doing this sort of a little bit extra work up front, like I said, defining your types and things like that, I find works pretty well overall. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, Python is still great and I still use it for a lot of things, but yeah. I, I do use Kotlin for a lot of projects now. Yeah. Yeah, so whatever you like, right? Yeah, whatever okay. is, is, is right for that application, yeah. Okay, so the next question is, what are the most challenging you have faced? This project, project. I, yeah, this project had a number of challenges. Um, yeah. You know, it was, uh, again, creating something new, not, not being able to get a definitive answer. So, so part of the talk says, you know, I needed to run 100 million hands or so before I got to an accurate number. A anything yeah. less than that, there's too much internal volatility. Um, and really, even 100 million is more, more like the minimum. Once I really got it where I wanted to, I ran up to like a billion hands to really start to um, uh, converge on the correct yeah. answer. Um, so, so doing that was hard, you know, it's a lot of tweaking and analyzing it as opposed to, again, a normal um, type of software application where it's like, you know what the inputs and you know what the outputs are gonna be um here you're just iterating and hope, yeah. hoping that it's right and also little things can get in the way so it one of the things that was funny in my code was you have to reshuffle the, the deck of cards obviously virtually python you know because it doesn't use braces or anything it uses indents this took me a long time to figure out but i had it shuffling after it dealt every hand as opposed to only when the only when the cards were empty, and that was only due to one indentation in a loop, and so it was slowing down the processing yeah. more because it was shuffling yeah. it meant way more than it needed to. And shuffling is an expensive operation. You know, you're generating randomness, um, so it was just like one indentation that slowed down my my whole thing by like 5x until I figured that out. So it was it kind of crazy, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Right. Okay, so another question. Uh, I uh, I see that you're using Spot instead on AWS. Any pros and cons about that? Um, you know, for my purposes, it works great because I was, you know, the whole point is I'm getting on and getting off relatively yeah. quickly. You know, my sessions would be 15 minutes or 45 minutes or something. You know, spot instances really only downside is that they can kick you off at any time. Any time, yeah. Right. But, yeah. you know, again, I'm not running a 24 seven server operation. Yeah. I'm just running, you know, so yeah. I think it happened only once that they kicked me off and it was like, okay, you know, I went out and got lunch or something and then came back and- Can run it again. Did that later, yeah, and it was fine. Yeah. So, you know, with the cost savings, um, again, okay, I'm only running things for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, like I just said. It, I still wasn't going to run up like a huge bill. But yeah, I mean, why not do it a spot instance and save, you know, 70%, you know, instead of spending $3, just $1, you know, so yeah. Yeah, that's a great answer. Okay, another question. Do you know what is happening under the cover with Joblet? Is it using processor or some type of a sync method? You know, I I did read about it. And like I said, they have multiple threading options. So mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to explain it here because I will not mm -hmm. do it correctly. But like one of the threading options was to use like multi-processing uh, library under the hood. Um, there's different things, but if you go to their website, you can read about it and find out more. Like I said, I, I, I did try to learn a little bit, um, but if I 
if I gave the answer here, I would be wrong. So I'm not going to do that. Okay, it's okay. Yeah, so the next, next question. question. Yeah. Okay, next question. You highlight this method may not work with more advanced models such as Panda, etc. Do you have a gut feeling there uh, is a limitation in Joblib in this case? Yeah, that's a great question too. So I, I really <laughs> just wanted to um, sort of make a disclaimer just because um, it's more it's more to give credit to Pandas. I think Joblib would probably handle it fine. I think my only issue is Pandas may already have, you know, it's a it it does vector math, so it may already have uh, optimization functions built into it. So it's I don't it's not that I think Joblib would have a problem. I just think that it may not boost it if pandas is like already doing similar things uh -huh. under the hood. So I think it's more that both projects, Joblib and pandas are very, very good at what they do, that there may not be further optimizations by combining them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Andy. The next question. Uh, when we want to optimize something, maybe some method or function, do you have any general recommendation for us? Yeah, um, it, it's hard to come up with a general recommendation, but I think you have to understand the code and what's what's going on and try to figure out, you know, where your bottlenecks are. Of course, that's important <laughs> is to, to understand that and focus on on those, you know, loops and things like that, um, you know, or where code sometimes gets tied up. Um, Python, you know, it took me a while to figure out, but like, using generators as opposed to starting with a list or an array and looping through that, you know, you're, you're lessening the load in terms of memory and things like that. And it's a little tricky to really understand and get under the hood, but, you know, yield as opposed to just a standard loop, um, yeah, can be very effective um, in, in parts of code like, like that where you're looping and things like that. But, um, um, yeah, it's just hard to get like a one size fits all type of um, answer. And I guess the other thing I would say is as much, I mentioned it a little earlier, as much functional programming as possible without side effects um, generally tends to be fast code too, because again, there's no side effects. You're not maintaining state elsewhere and stuff. It's just in and out. Boom. Yeah. Stretch forward, pretty safe right. forward. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So the next question: How do you motivate people to think out of the box when it's come to making something faster? How do you motivate them? Um, you know, I mean, yeah. well, the motivation usually comes from you know within. It's like okay, within. I'm, yeah, right. I'm right. sick of waiting here. I'm sick of doing this. You know, that's certainly what happened to me in this project. It's like okay this runs, but I'm not going to get an answer for four hours or overnight or something like, no, I need to get this up to speed quicker. So, you know, I, I have to go out of my way and add, you know, take working code and improve it, you know, um, put more effort into it. But again, like the motivation is just, you know, practical like hey i i need to get results faster than i'm already getting at, at it um you know as far as thinking out of the box it sort of goes to what i was saying earlier where it's like you have to really all your experience overall comes into play in terms of other packages that you may have seen at one time that you've never gotten around to using or that you just heard about somewhere or or new patterns and things like that. So um, even again, thinking things through that you may have learned in another language, you know, like I just said, Kotlin is really, um, you know, functional is built into it. So sort of taking that over, you know, Python, instead of using list comprehensions, you know, using the collection package and getting the map and filtering uh, from that, using that, even though it's maybe a little bit less totally Pythonic, but 
it works, you know? So I don't know if that's out of the box, but you're sort of cross-referencing the way different languages work. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Andy, can you tell us more about Dilla first? Blackjack you invented? Yeah. And I, I see uh, Andrew's question too. So it's a yeah. real game. It's a real game. Unfortunately, it is not in any casinos today. Um, besides, besides the technical parts of creating a model, there's a lot of intellectual property things, trying to trademark the name and get patents on the methods that it uses. So that was a big delay um, in terms of like me starting to go out and sell the game or demonstrate the game. Um, but I am working, you know, I've talked to a bunch of people. I have, um, you know, uh, brochures and, um, wow. you know, so, so the marketing is going on. We're trying to get somebody yeah. with some, um, some interest and people have like given me some, some good tips, but there is, you can play it online. If you go to dealerfirstblackjack.com, there is a JavaScript version that works online. You can play the game right now or, or tonight, tomorrow, whenever. Um, so you yeah. can see how it works. So that was a, that was a challenge is, is going back and going back to all my JavaScript and learning all that again, like, cause I haven't done a lot of front end stuff. So, um, trying to write a game in, in JavaScript was, was, was a challenge. Fun, right? <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. So we will leave the link in the box. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> right. We'll leave the, okay. So Andy, where can we follow you and your amazing work? Thanks. Uh, well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, my personal website is, I'll put that in, www.cf. Yeah. www.cf. Nine N I N E. Um, my consulting company is called Centerfield Nine, so CF Nine is just sort of abbreviation. Um, and I've got some articles there. Uh, I've got some links to some other projects and things like that. Um, but yeah, I love to talk to people. Um, I also I'm also on Twitter at at CF Nine at CF Nine. So yeah, I just love uh, talking to people. And I thank you so much for this particular opportunity and just um, the whole conference in general. And uh, it's been a lot of fun and I've learned a lot as well. So I really appreciate all these, um, you know, sessions and the one that we did uh, yesterday have been great. So mm -hmm. thanks it's to all amazing. the people who watch my presentation and are here right now, spectators. Thank you guys, mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Yeah, it's my honor to interview you. Thanks so much. <laughs> That's very kind. Okay, so attendee, if you want to like chat with Andy, you can raise your hand and hop in. We still got time, I think. Okay. Anybody want to talk to Andy? I'm so excited right now talking to him. <laughs> you know, like I say, it's my honor. <laughs> wow. Okay. Anybody, Andrew or anyone? Let me check who's here. Yeah, I think we're good. I think that's, I think we covered it nicely, guys. So, yeah, terrific. Thanks. That's cool. So, thank you so much, Andy. And everyone, please enjoy the race of the conference. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, thank you guys. Thanks so much, Rose. Yeah, you've been great. Yeah. And Andrew as well. Yep. Yeah. For sure. Thank Cheers. you. Bye-bye.